farmers and he has addressed many uh, problems issues uh, dr vikas kumar uh, working here as a senior scientist prior to this he has worked uh, in uh, institute uh, isa institute uh, that is uh, igfri jhasi uh, there uh, he worked uh, mainly uh, on uh, uh, this uh, uh, demonstration and uh, transfer of technology uh, to the farmers on the fodder and uh, allied uh, subjects and uh, he is closely worked uh, on uh, the economics of uh, fodder crops and uh, its uh, technology uh, transfer to the farmers during his uh, uh tenure at uh, jasi and uh, here also he is working uh, in a uh, uh, very important area that is uh, risk management that is uh, in crop insurance uh, schemes so government of india he has analyzed uh, that data and all and um, uh, did a very good uh, appreciable work uh, in the risk, uh, risk management uh, he is also involved in this uh, sc sub plan project wherein he is developing the database uh, for uh, uh, different uh, uh, cropping systems uh, he is working in three states uh, that is haryana uh, rajasthan and uh, up uh, for uh, building this database which will be useful it will be accessible to uh, the researchers uh, in due course of time so he is uh, work at this institute is also a commendable work and apart from this with his interest the topic which he has, he has chosen today for this class uh, uh, that is uh, management of stake cattle that is also he worked on uh, it uh, because uh, it is uh, not a routine activity of uh, research scientist but uh, with his interest and uh, to understand the efficacy and the constraint and the problems related to uh, this uh, stake cattle uh, management uh, he uh, devoted some time on this uh, that's what he is going to uh, speak you in this uh, session because uh, as you know that um, uh, government also very sincere and uh, very uh, critical on the management of stake cattle in the country and uh, same times farmers also facing a lot of problem uh, to manage the stake cattle uh, cattle uh, i mean here not only cow uh, buffalo uh, male uh, particularly which are uh, left by the uh, owner uh, on the mercy of god and uh, they are uh, not uh, disturbing to uh, owner but also the entire society so much uh, accident and uh, uh, damage of crops uh, taking place many time government also pointing out uh, this thing uh, that uh, the animals need to be managed uh, properly so he uh, uh, with interest uh, uh, he has uh, chosen this uh, topic and he is going to deliberate dr vikas we welcome you uh, once again to this session and hope Uh, our uh, participants will be benefited with your deliberations so now floor is yours thank you thank you sir thank you sir uh, good afternoon all the participants uh, let me is uh, is shared sir Yes, visible. Just make it uh, slides off, full of the screen. Uh, Is it uh, in slides so mode, sir? Ah, uh, now now you are all right. Okay. Good afternoon, Hello. all the participants. Uh, i am dr vikas kumar uh, now the topic is uh, for this session is uh, economics of uh, management of stray animals in farmers field uh, we know that agriculture is a very risky business that uh, uh, we know that how the farmers are doing the this agriculture business uh, despite uh, what we see here different type of risk the farmers are facing 
production risk, market risk, institutional risk, and personal risk, financial number of risk. In that production risk, we know the climate risk about. The climate risk uh, is a uh, very much uh, familiar. It's out of control. Most of the risks are out of control of farmers. One important risk is reaching now uh, in the agriculture field that is the security of the crops. Uh, if you uh, you may you, you are visiting regularly in the farmers' fields and you may be uh, noticing this thing that if you ask the farmers what are your uh, prominent constants in agriculture, then you will finding that. Uh, uh, security of crops is coming as a lead constant in production of agriculture crops because other constants are very much familiar with the farmers but uh, this is a new one and uh, uh, because uh, so this is a leading constant and because of this uh, security of the crops uh, security of the crops from different animals they are unable to follow whatever the uh, suggestions we make to them uh, different policies of the governments are not uh, uh, reaching in that uh, uh, total uh, to the farmers, uh, our we are not able to get our objectives. That is the increase of income of farmers because uh, this security is a very uh, tough issue. You may be uh, encountering this issue also uh, when you interact with the farmers. So uh, lots of time they devote in uh, uh, protecting their crops from uh, different types of animals, and we are also uh, not able to convince the farmers to grow different type of crops because uh, these are the vulnerable to uh, these animals. As we see the monkeys, in the areas where the monkeys are prominent, we are unable to guide the farmers uh, uh, this, uh, uh, to grow these uh, orchard-like crops. Blue bulls is a very uh, uh, pernicious uh, in the farmers' fields. And now uh, increasing menace of uh, stray cattle and then wild boars and various domestic animals. These are all uh, issues uh, creating problems to the farmers. So, uh, this is a common uh, here. We see these are uh, all the time, daytime they are roaming in the uh, our roads and evening time they reach in the farmer's field. So, uh, for the protection of their crops, the farmer has to all the time uh, uh, stand in the fields. If we calculate in the mandate basis, then it will be very uh, a costly business to protect the crop, which is not a part of economic analysis also. Uh, even uh, if we see that uh, it's looking like a one day uh, daily they have to pay, uh, give uh, uh, to protect the crops. And it's a very uh, 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 harmful also. Uh, these are the very big uh, animals. Most of them are uh, bulls. 80% of the roaming animals are bulls. So uh, uh, keeping them away from the fields is uh, very tough also. They sometimes uh, injure the farmers also. So here, uh, these are blue bulls picture, not good. So what is the numbers, stray cattle number? We discuss here mostly on the stray cattle because uh, other topics are a little more uh, 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 different. So uh, take a little more time. So here, uh, about 50 lakh stray cattle are there in India. This is the official figure. And if we see the real numbers, that may be sometime more than this. Because what we have observed uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in an ordinary village of uh, uh, 150 to uh, 200 hectares area, uh, about 100 animals are roaming around the village all the time. So these are always a threat to the farmer's fields. And this is the official figure we see uh, the real figures is much more than the, this, maybe this, more than this. Uh, to keep these uh, stray animals uh, away from the farmer's field, the government has uh, opened number of goshalas uh, shelter homes for the cattle. That is uh, 1840, about 2000 registered goshalas we have, but uh, unregistered goshala number are many more than this. There are unregistered number of unregistered goshalas which are not registered with the animal welfare board. So this is the registered one, and that is uh, still many more are required to be opened. Uh, uh, this is the incidents. Uh, as you see, that the incidents of uh, cattle uh, are uh, uh, very low. Uh, otherwise, uh, you see uh, the numbers are many more. So what are the reasons? We see. What are the reasons that these cattle, uh, these animals or stray animals are enter entering uh, in the farmers' fields? Uh, we see uh, their uh, habitats uh, is uh, snatched away because our all the area is coming under the 
agriculture now our uh, style of uh, livelihood is changed livelihood is changed because earlier we were depending on the these animals uh, now the machines have come we have changed our style of living so uh, uh, we less requiring uh, these uh, animals uh, degradation fragmentation small uh, areas are left uh, so we have very less area for food grain production so we can't uh, go for uh, uh, fodder and other areas grasslands and other areas agriculture intensive agriculture practices are there human and livestock population so these are the various reasons that are uh, uh, we know all the reasons that uh, uh, are leading to this our here issue is that uh, this is turning as a major issue in the our agriculture uh, areas if we don't touch then we will be uh, touching various issues but uh, this is turning as a biggest uh, problem if we interact with the farmers what they say what is the reason behind this uh, uh, encroachment of uh, cattle in the farmers fields they say they rank these uh, issues in the three uh, points lower productivity of the cattle this is the first reason if you see the and uh, because uh, we, we know that uh, this uh, national uh, productivity of uh, our cows is uh, average is very low it is 2 to 2.5 liters per day so from the 2.5 liter we cannot uh, balance the cost so it is very low uh, production of these our uh, especially uh, animals so productivity is very low if the productivity is high 10 liters 12 liters then certainly they can give sufficient income in the in the hands of farmers so they can be reared by the farmers so productivity is very low and second is non availability of cattle market if the productivity is low certainly the farmer will sell them but these markets are not there so where they can sell that that is the issue if production is low farmer can sell whatever uh, uh, this uh, junk material is there in our households we, if we don't like we sell because uh, we don't have space but uh, in this case markets are not there a very little market lesser market are left so this is another issue which is leading uh, to uh, a continuation of these animals in the surrounding of the villages third is the cost of uh, fodder if the protein is low and the cost of fodder is also low there is no issue then but the cost of fodder is high so even uh, this 2 liter of milk uh, and this uh, cost of fodder cannot be uh, purchased so if we are able to uh, produce the very cheap fodder then there will not be issue but that fodder is not cheap so that's why the farmers are leaving their animals and once they leave the animals the animals keep roaming around the villages and they keep waiting that uh, if you uh, are not in the fields they will uh, enter in the fields okay what are the various economic measures to control these animals and uh, uh, so so that uh, both can be happy animals and farmers uh, so i have divided the measures into three groups one is a long term measure short term measure medium term measure and long term measures so these measures we can adopt uh, to keep uh, uh, the this uh, problems away from the farmers fields what uh, is a simple measure this uh, natural thorn bushes these are the simply uh, uh, this uh, protection like this so some farmers are uh, protecting their crops uh, who are very marginal very have low income they have this only option uh, to protect the crop and uh, the cost of this protection is very low about 5 6000 because in that the thorns are these bushes are free they just go and cut that and uh, erect uh, surrounding their fields so this is the one method uh, in that uh, hardly 10 to 15 man days are required uh, to uh, erect these all bushes around the one hectare land so this is the one method but it is not a uh, sustaining it is a uh, hardly uh, live for 6 uh, to 1 year 6 month to 1 year so very short period is there and after that uh, they have to again manage this uh, repair this so it is a uh, tough but it is the only option with the, our small farmers and who don't have money and uh, so this is a kind of way the farmers are doing it's a common now uh, uh, see this is a common and you know the cost of it so that we can suggest the farmers if we don't have the money and uh, uh, this is uh, some other measures we have the thorny cactus also uh, they are erect these are erected surrounding the fields so that less animals will go but they still uh, there are possibilities so and another measure another measure is a trench we uh, we make this kind of trenches around the fields 
and uh, so that uh, animals will not jump uh, over this. Uh, but uh, the issue is that uh, uh, this uh, this is a very uh, cheap method, and uh, in that about sixteen thousand rupees is required per hectare of land. This uh, we have calculated from the farmers' fields only. Uh, so very low, sixteen seventeen thousand, because one. Uh, uh, this uh, backhoe loader, what we say, JCB type of machine, can uh, do this uh, in I think uh, one day only. Uh, this uh, trench making in a in a one hectare land because uh, in one hour, um, uh, 30 40 meters or you can say 100 meters it can take. Uh, this uh, and this trench is very good system. In that soil should be on the this field side. This uh, this uh, pile of soil should be on the field side so that uh, animals cannot jump over it. And this uh, depth of uh, about four to five feet, and the width of this uh, maybe uh, four to five, four four feet is enough. Animals never fall in it, and this is the very cheap, uh, fast uh, uh, raising method, so that we can uh, uh, protect our fields, and we can be little uh, uh, happy with this. And we have done this in uh, more than two kilometers in this field. Uh, what the farmer has done wrong here, he has. Uh, turn the soil other side of the field so that uh, these animal will come here and jump this side. So uh, this is a little wrong and uh, soil should be for field side so that farmer will jump and it will fall in, inside it. And we, we have seen that no animal will fall in it. Animals are very clever. Once they say there is a, some kind of uh, protection, they will never jump on other side. So uh, these are the trenches. This had uh, uh, now uh, come uh, uh, completed again this has grown these trenches are to be repaired every two three years so that uh, it will uh, maintain their heights and width otherwise the animals will go uh, easily inside this and will reach other side so these are the very good protection easy protection and this can be cannot be stolen beauty of this is uh, it cannot be stolen because uh, we can do this in our farms which are very at a long distance because uh, in, in the forest area we have done this in the forest area uh, this is then the forest area. This is about the forest area, and we suggested the forest department to make a trench. And uh, then we had grown the good fodder inside this forest, and it was a very good fodder uh, without a, at a very lesser cost. So this can be done because forest department say if we grow the fodder, animals will uh, uh, eat that in a very small stage also uh, only. So we can't uh, get uh, the height of the fodder. We can't get the production of the fodder. So. We have got the, this uh, more than 200 hectares of uh, land for was selected, and this we have uh, trench was made with, uh, easily. So we have the uh, way, and the cost of this is very low. You know, 15, 16, 17 thousand only. So easy, uh, this cannot be taken. Another is the barbed wire. This is a barbed wire. Uh, it's a wire like this, and we are well familiar with this, and the cost of it is also. Uh, not a very high, uh, same thing uh, is coming. Uh, three, four lines of barbed wires are to be erected. Uh, this. Sometimes, because from, for the long distance field, the, uh, the, 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 the thieves are taking, taking this away. That's the issue in this. So, but it, it's the method uh, is okay, uh, somewhat uh, uh, for the farmers, uh, they are doing this to protect their fields because without doing this, there is no technology possible in the farmer's field, no decision you can. Uh, can't do. So this is the another method and uh, it's a good easy method. Uh, we know all. There is a, uh, another kind of wire, we see the saw wire because uh, that's a kind of uh, very uh, sharp edges are there but that is not uh, officially or legally allowed but this wire is allowed to protect the fields. This is the option with the farmers and uh, three four lines of wires if we are making animals uh, are not uh, able to enter but uh, if they are hungry they will be entering they will jump or they will come uh, from the uh, below the wires and even gods can enter so there are issues there are uh, uh, ways uh, these are the we can do this uh, you know, at a small notice with the poles uh, wooden poles or we can do with this uh, 150 rupees uh, uh, cement poles these are the barbed wires so this is we have seen these uh, animals have uh, from this uh, barbed wire they have uh, uh, this uh, graze the crop wheat crop from the wires only so less protection is there but is a uh, hope because uh, uh, in a, a short measure short term measure this is an option with us 
So uh, we have done this uh, in the fields and we are suggesting that uh, this option with you. Okay, one more method we can adopt with bar wire if we are adding the fence, natural bush fence. So, so that is a better protection because bush needs uh, some support. So wire wire along with this uh, natural bushes is a better option. Uh, so the farmers uh, can protect their field without protection is uh, nothing is possible. And uh, I will show you the, how the farmers are uh, 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 showing their issues. This is another issue is that if we are, uh, uh, because the cost is you have seen is uh, 14, 15,000 for barbed wire or uh, trench is 16,000, 20,000 something. So if we are making the trenches uh, uh, on a community basis, means surrounding the villages, whole village, so that less cost will come for the individual farmers. So the cost will be negligible. If we are able to make a uh, uh, on the surrounding uh, where the entry points of the uh, animals. So these are the uh, short term measures. So that uh, is a, a good method. And that's the methods are adopted in Bulan Sahar, Meerut. And these areas, people are putting the community fences. Uh, so all farmers get together and the, uh, compile the money and they erect on the special points. So we have another chain link fence. Chain link fence cost is one like uh, 13,000, one like 20,000, something cost per hectare is for chain link fence are like this well known to you. And uh, these are, the, I have seen, these are the very sustainable long-term uh, measures. These are the methods which can uh, long for 20 years. And uh, okay, in that case also, we, if we are making the community kind of fences uh, surrounding the villages, the cost will be very low, hardly five to 10,000. For that, if we um, uh, uh, make, uh, make a leader in the uh, village and uh, ask that uh, you uh, uh, ask the farmers uh, to uh, collect the money, that is the best method. I have seen this uh, life of this is more than 20 years and it has no losses. So this uh, is cost is hardly one like 20,000 for erection of these uh, chain link fence, we can use the iron poles, uh, this wooden poles and cement poles, anything uh, uh, is a, it's a good method. And this farmer has done this and see the protection has resulted. If we are having the chain link fence like this, uh, even in the one year or two years, we can get our cost back. Well, government is giving kind of subsidies uh, in, uh, in purchase of these uh, fences, but uh, uh, because, uh, uh, we have uh, this option to purchase on our own also. This we have done this with wooden poles uh, in uh, uh, protection of this. And, and this is a good for all kinds of animals. Because when I suggest the farmers, you grow this variety of potato, ginger, or any other thing, this wild boar is a very big problem. They dig up the potatoes and nothing is left in the fields. And uh, otherwise, uh, we, I will discuss later on uh, what the farmers are adopting. These are the chain link fans, uh, and uh, these are adopted by the farmers and the crop. We can see uh, uh, is better uh, uh, without uh, this. So electric fans. One more method is there: electric fans. This is a commonly sold uh, now. Uh, it is uh, less uh, cost is there five to ten thousand rupees. We can purchase this electric fence for one hectare of land. Very uh, cheap method. Uh, life is also good, um, five to six, seven years. Uh, life it can be purchased from our online uh, our apps, uh, Amazon, etc. Easy to install, but there is a risk as uh, uh, we are the government officials uh, because uh, lots of uh, care is required in these uh, fences. In if we erect uh, these uh, fences in a farmer's field because the children's uh, child, uh, these children are not knowing that uh, you have erected the fence. Rainy season, the current may flow the ground or our domestic animals, uh, small animals are there. Uh, they may, uh, may be uh, uh, having the injury to, because of this. So these are the fences, very uh, cheap, you know, five to 10,000 rupees. It's quite different type of machines privately are sold. Uh, these are electric fences run by the battery or solar panels. Very easy to install and small, uh, we can say, jhatka type uh, we get uh, uh, from uh, one or two second uh, uh, jhatka and, and because of that animals uh, don't come near to it. Uh, it's a very hard wire and uh, so these uh, are erected. See here we have done this in the farmers field. This field is having the barbed wire and this field is having 
uh, chain link fence. You see this uh, insulator is lined, so this is the chain link fence. So this field was grazed by uh, animals two, three times. So height is a uh, difference, height, difference of uh, height is there. So the yield of this crop uh, will be certainly 25, 30% uh, less than this field. This field was grazed by once, uh, once by the animals. So in a, uh, just in a period of 15 to 20 days only, it has got the extra height of six to seven inches. Then this, so we have, we have seen uh, uh, this uh, clearly uh, benefits uh, uh, farmers are receiving uh, because of this, but risk is there because in daytime, uh, the farmers are keeping uh, this switch off so that uh, uh, this uh, uh, children cannot uh, touch this. Children, or sometimes I have seen that uh, injuries are there. Sometimes farmer is, uh, I have seen one case that farmer was fallen due to uh, rainy, in, the, in the rainy season because the slippery land was there and farmer was fallen over this, uh, and this uh, uh, electric fence and he died. So it's a little risky and uh, uh, so, but it is a very cheap method uh, with the farmers and uh, farmers are, uh, as I say, uh, it's a good method, but with care. Without care, we cannot leave this uh, fence. Uh, so I, I find uh, uh, this is the, see the two fields are there. This is the field which are having wire wire and that field is having a chain link fan or that uh, electric fan. So difference in um, height we can see, and this is regularly grazed by the animals by putting their neck inside. Uh, so uh, these are the losses the farmers are incurring because of uh, grazing all the farmers especially where the uh, people are not the young uh, people are not there they cannot come regularly to see their crops so these are the common losses uh, wooden poles and tying this uh, this uh, chain uh, this uh, electric fence to protect uh, from the gods uh, these are the uh, these are the insulator on uh, every poles uh, so this uh, uh, current uh, losses of current uh, is not there. So it's a very good method. It depends on the what kind of animals are attacking attacking your fields. Uh, if uh, small animals are there, we, we put the these wires on a very lower side, otherwise uh, on a, a, a little height, so animals cannot jump it. But issues are there, this is a big issue uh, and we have to give solutions. So I suggested that uh, even after the, this uh, electric fence, you raise uh, this uh, uh, shrubs so that children cannot uh, touch this, uh, this wire, wire is not visible in the picture, but insulator is visible. Uh, so uh, they have to give a kind of, uh, and this is the very uh, severe issues. We should know what are the various ways, what is the cost, what are the issues, uh, with that so that we can uh, uh, suggest uh, our technologies otherwise these farmers unable to take decisions and uh, we have seen a big uh, uh, changes in the decisions of farmers are coming because of this see this is uh, an insulator this is a wire and this is a very tough wire uh, so uh, farmer these animals cannot break this uh, but risky, uh, so uh, child, uh, because otherwise disputes will start in the villages. This is the wild wire area and uh, uh, see number of times the animals have grazed this. So crop is not uniform. Some is uh, low and uh, some is high. And so losses are very uh, common. Another is uh, our medium term measures. Medium term measures are, uh, uh, we have to uh, suggest the farmers. These are the short term measures uh, which are common, uh, uh, which uh, we can do instantly uh, less money or we can say we can, there's no time required. Another methods are uh, creation of awareness among, among the farmers. That will take time because uh, lots of trainings, uh, lots of uh, farmers ghosties are required so that we can aware the farmers. Uh, so uh, uh, that what crop they should grow, how to uh, keep their animals, how to keep your animals uh, high yielding. So these are the medium term measures, uh, uh, lots of this. Uh, and, uh, and that uh, animals uh, in the goshalas, whatever uh, you've seen the 2000 goshalas, registered goshalas, they should also have high yielding fodder so that animals should not go out in the farmer's field. Okay, one more method I have seen because uh, every panchayat should have a grasslands because whatever extra animals are there, they will be going in the grassland. And uh, if this is not there, there is no solution. We should have the solution, we should not say and solutions should be 
uh, adopted by all, should be uh, accepted by all. We should not say this is a killing of cows or uh, this thing, this thing. So our solution should be universal in adoption. Our solution should be adopted by farmers and the government officials, different religious communities equally. All should be happy. It should not be like that uh, one-sided solution and uh, certainly some cost may be incurred in this. So grasslands should be there in each panchayat. There are grasslands already there in the grass uh, in our areas in each panchayat, but these grasslands are not managed properly. So each village is having grassland. We see that uh, grassland area is there in the, each villages, but these uh, have not having grasses. These are the common um, uh, roaming areas for the animals. So these are the this should be the grassland and uh, there should be high yielding products. What should be the area? I suppose forestry uh, in the forestry cattle, about 100 stray cattle, there should be three hectares of land, uh, open land with high yielding fodder so that 100 stray cattle can stay in that. So uh, there should be uh, clear cut uh, directions. So for the forest, uh, this uh, fodder should be high yielding fodder should be developed so uh, this can be controlled. Another thing, because we are to now depending on the yield of animals, the, the uh, production of animal is uh, calculated from the yield of uh, milk. Oh, but uh, we should uh, calculate, uh, we should also get uh, uh, income from the byproduct of animals, uh, urine, cow dung, so that uh, the cost of animals can be shared by the byproducts also. Uh, we, are, uh, we have uh, seen that a number of uh, goshalas are doing this. They are not depending on, because at the, once the uh, age of the cow is beyond 12 years, uh, yield, yield of milk is very low. So other uh, byproducts are the left with us uh, for production. So agroforestry system, because uh, uh, we are uh, because uh, we are turning towards the uh, crops only. So uh, because uh, this uh, continuous encroachment by animals, we have to shift a little, divert our areas towards the orchards, medicinal plants, amla, papaya, which are not liked by the animals. So this is the option. These are also having a good. Uh, uh, so uh, it's of some area in the villages is diverted towards this. So uh, less risk will be there in the income of the farmer that will be continuously coming. This is amla orchard, which is not preferred by the animals, but certainly monkey may be eating. Uh, but uh, for the cattle, it's not a fodder. So this is a this is also a fibrous uh, a banana less uh, preferred lemon this medicinal plant flowers this may be option with the farmers uh, so he can get the income instead of uh, grain crop which are palatable to the animals this is uh, uh, different crops okay we have different uh, long term measures so uh, uh, to uh, to increase the income this uh, yield of the cattle improvement long term measures which can be adopted in three okay it will take a little more time it's not easy in one day only improvement of productivity of the cattle as we see the cattle productivity is very low that's why the farmers are leaving them we should increase because they are not leaving the high yielding cattle this uh, cross breeds are not left by the farmers these are the, our country cattle the desi cattle uh, which are left by the farmers the high yielding cattle are there that is uh, in giving you 10 years 10 liters or more milk so that issue is not there in, with that, with them. So improvement of productivity of cattle, we have seen our cattle are reaching to Brazil and other nations where they are giving high yields. They have improved the cattle, uh, our desi cows. And uh, now Brazil is giving a very good yield from the Sindhi, uh, what we say, uh, uh, these cows. In their country, they have improved our breeds. Upgradation of goshalas. Goshalas are very traditionally run units, have less funds. So we have to increase the uh, improve uh, inject the technology in them so that uh, it will be run and uh, that there is a chance of uh, because uh, they are very little money with the goshalas. So uh, these are run by two three peoples only uh, kind of uh, depending units only. So this should not be like this. But I have done one goshala was there in uh, Bundelkhand. It was a self sufficient. We have done this. It is possible. There is no issue. 
And because the cows, uh, even after 10 to 12 years, uh, they are giving lots of byproducts, even from the fodder or uh, grasses, uh, stem, roots, we can have good earning. Uh, it is not uh, uh, this uh, uh, milk only, which is uh, giving you milk, uh, which giving you income. Livestock machines. So uh, different uh, things we can make uh, because uh, bulls have very uh, less uses uh, right now. So uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, if we uh, do this, uh, different kind of machines, because they have high demand. I have seen that uh, bulls are used in uh, uh, making the electricity instead of uh, uh, making uh, different works are assigned to the bulls. So they are roaming here and there, and, and we can have the work from these uh, uh, animals. So there is no issue uh, in that. Uh, cow dung poles, uh, this uh, Diwali, Deepak are made by this uh, uh, cow dung. So uh, upgradation of goshalas. Uh, so uh, this is possible. And uh, another is important uh, issue is that uh, cattle market is a very important issue because uh, right now cattle market is very less. So uh, we should uh, think on this area that uh, there should be more and more cattle markets uh, uh, so that farmer can uh, uh, sell their less uh, producing, uh, production, uh, cat producing cattle in that and um, more goshalas may be there uh, so that uh, extra cattle may be getting shelters in that. Because uh, if we are uh, not uh, able to uh, utilize these cattle, then these will be continuously roaming around and uh, lots of injuries, lots of fear, because uh, you may be going in the villages and finding, uh, you just uh, inquire there and you may be inquiring regularly, what are the, uh, how you cope up with. And suddenly they, because as most of us are uh, government uh, uh, officials, so they say, please give the solution to this. And we simply say them, uh, you you uh, interact with the agriculture department, animal husbandry department, or we say administration, but uh, uh, they are not uh, satisfied with the response from them also. So we have to give the solution to them. It is not a, we shift them towards uh, different sites and uh, uh, solution uh, because as the Mahatma Gandhi told that uh, uh, the villages should be units of uh, self-sufficiency. It should not be kind of we should uh, depend on others. So all the things can be possible at even at the panchayat level. <clears throat> so this is the, uh, uh, we can have a CPRs. And uh, further from the CPR, we have the canal, big canal is there, big road is there. And on the both side of road, lots of land is there. And that land can be used for uh, growing of some uh, small uh, fodder. Uh, and uh, we have done this uh, efforts and maybe picture maybe here. This is our forest in uh, some area in the Jhansi, and this is non palatable fodder. Uh, earlier, I have grown this here, the palatable fodder. So, if we have the palatable fodder in the forest, these animals will not go in the farmer's field. So, uh, the forest has lots of land, more than 20 million hectare land is there, and this forest, forest land uh, space is there in the forest. Lots of space is there in the forest to grow the fodder so that these all extra animals will go in the forest. They will not go inside the and uh, this non palatable fodders, uh, which are non palatable crops, which are there in the fo uh, forest area, uh, will, uh, uh, will give the fodder. Uh, we have seen this, we have done this, and uh, this is possible. And uh, uh, earlier also, we have done this, and more, this all areas can be converted to good fodder lands. So that um, this is the what we have 15 lakhs animals, stray animals can easily be accommodated in these forest areas. So there will not be issue that the farmers can, this is the canal. This is a big canal. We have tried to raise the fodder on the banks of the canal. This is a big bank. This is one kilometer of land and we have grown the fodder on it. So this fodder can do many things. These animals will be gra grazing this. Villagers will be taking this fodder to their, uh, what we say, uh, for their uh, purpose, and this will be protecting our uh, erosion also. So all the benefits, this is a kind of, it's a big bank is there for all kind of canal, all kind of road, all kind of railway tracks. So there is uh, uh, issues with what we are guessing, getting if we are uh, coming together, uh, uh, different bodies, 
and this is a uh, started by because uh, this canal department some officials they interacted and they asked that we want uh, uh, to uh, protect this uh, canal bank so we suggested that we grow this uh, high yielding fodders on it and it was uh, agreed uh, and uh, without any money these villagers have grown this so villagers are not uh, against anything uh, that uh, uh, they uh, they also want solutions and solutions can be provided if we all come together and uh, guide them so there is no issue of 50 lakh cattle to manage so this all possible uh, so we have seen different uh, methods uh, through which uh, we can uh, 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 keep these stray animals away from the our farmers field so animals will be happy and this all our villagers land will be happy and this is community participation what we say at the end i like to say this uh, chain link fence i have found that's a very good effective measures if uh, if uh, if we uh, if all uh, village uh, people are agreed, then uh, cost per uh, person is less than 10,000, maybe 1,000 to some time, because we have done this in one village area. So uh, chain link fence on where, where entry points are there. Uh, so uh, this uh, will be the very good methods. We have the Manrega and the government is always ready to, uh, to provide support from the Manrega or other bodies to erect this so this is a very good method uh, and uh, i have seen it's long lasting i i am little less supporter of uh, electric fans uh, reason of uh, that uh, possible uh, uh, injury to our any any of the uh, human or animals and electric is electric once i have touched that i have never, never didn't touch a uh, uh, second time because i hesitate uh, so uh, if the, by, by mistake animals are touching many times, it is uh, difficult to tolerate. So this uh, is all uh, to keep these animals uh, away from our uh, fields. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, please inform us uh, your issues regarding this. So. Uh, uh, I like uh, that from the participants. If you are facing uh, when you interact with the in the villages, you do you face uh, this kind of problem uh, that uh, our farmers are facing? Do you feel kind of problem? Yes, sir. They are facing. Uh, so what uh, some, what solutions we pig. give there? Pig is a major problem here, sir. Wild boar or pig is a major problem over here. So, uh, because uh, what solutions we give uh, there, or we simply say it is we can't do anything. What? They cannot shoot. Thing is that sir, even if Nilgai, okay, uh, Nilgai is common global is common. That's another problem over here. Uh, so, uh, uh, what are the solutions we uh, provide, or simply because uh, generally we say administration. We recognize the problem. Uh, so we recognize the problem. We try to estimate the problem, the damages, and all. And moreover, in some cases, in some places, uh, even elephants are a problem. We cannot do anything about that, right? It's man-animal conflict because uh, there used to be elephant areas. And if we are cultivating crops in those areas, and all, they cannot blame the animals. You know? They cannot even restrict the farmers because farmers are doing cultivation over there for more than 15 or 20 years. So it's a very sensitive issue, sir. We cannot take the side of farmers as well because sometimes farmers are also wrong. If they are cultivating in elephant corridors, you know, yeah, yeah, because yeah. only there, uh, then we cannot do anything about that. So uh, this, uh, do you agree with this? Because chain link fence is common. Uh, this uh, keeping the yeah. away, but uh, I don't support this. Uh, but it is adopted. No, it is widely adopted. Yes, especially in wild boar, they are using it. In case of wild boar or pig, it's not a problem. But in case of elephants. Or Neil guy also. That's a huge. It will cause any huge social uproar also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. We cannot uh, give weapons to farmers as well because in some places, maybe in some countries, as the USA, Canada, the farmers are given weapons. They can shoot any wild animal. They are given license as well. But here we cannot do that. Uh, some uh, sometimes government is giving uh, permission, but uh, it's uh, not sure. Uh, for long, uh, how long they are giving permission? That's the issue. Sometimes they give the, for two months permission. 
so uh, sometimes we are uh, still killing uh, after two months so some farmers will get trapped in the legal issues so, i think so maybe like you said changing in changes in cropping pattern is the only way forward we have to change you know some cropping pattern over there instead of going for sugar cane going for banana and all we have to go for some other crops which are non palatable for the animals that's the only way forward there is no need for all the farmers to grow the same crop maybe banana and all for example or groundnut over here there is no need not at all we have to no. go for changing crop what we have seen that uh, farmers uh, don't grow uh, so the crop in time because of this uh, uh, encroachment they wait that all the farmers should start sowing so they start sowing suppose you want to sow the, your wheat crop in uh, month of uh, november mid november but other farmers are not sowing so you should not uh, you will not come uh, forward all are waiting to start sowing uh, instantly because if you sow uh, your crop first uh, then your crop will be eaten away so these yes. are uh, very and if your crop is lasting in the field for long that is also very uh, susceptible vikas yes sir yeah uh, i'm share karo screen yes sir okay sir and share karo share ke upar bhi dabao yes sir ha ah, bas so this is all but uh, we, we should uh, uh, keep uh, informing the different ways to the farmers keep uh, analyzing the different ways which are uh, uh, very uh, sustainable to all uh, organizations farmers government even the religious groups we should have such kind of uh, methods uh, which are uh, uh, friendly to all sir one more one, one yes, small sir. query actually your presentation was really good and uh, you have uh, portrayed in a nice manner but uh, one point of uh, vision what i have is there any rigid policy measures for this stay cattle you know that in igfr also you may find in many cattle it is as if daily you can see one occurs as we are neighborhood and uh, we i used to visualize daily one cattle would be there always uh, so it will be hit by some four wheeler or some trucks but i could not find any policy measures for this. do is there any governmental measure for that? Uh, there is a people are hesitant on this topic uh, because uh, it is a kind of a mix of everything but uh, our uh, clients are farmers so we cannot uh, in this uh, confusion we cannot leave them uh, uh, alone so uh, we should keep on uh, searching on the areas how they should be uh, free from this problem because this is certainly is a very uh, typical uh, topic uh, but we may I, have recommended no sir that's what i am asking I, I, uh, I from our studies we may have recommended at a, at a single line is a single line like that from this project we have found out this like that. I have, 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 do we have any focus on that i uh, suggested that uh, farmers should protect their area through uh, chain link fence and that is through community uh, chain link fence because individual chain link fence is a uh, 1 lakh 20000 per hectare cost is a very big cost we cannot suggest to small farmers so uh, if uh, community uh, participation is there the same chain link fence will cost will per hectare will come hardly 10000 rupees 5000 rupees so all farmers can be accommodated means the entry points of the villages will be uh, having and uh, in that participation of elected body of the village is required sometime uh, these are the rivalries is going in the village but this is the only solution because we cannot keep uh, say that killing we cannot say uh, you erect all otherwise cost is very high we cannot say that even the government that please give subsidy to purchase the chain link fence because otherwise 1 lakh 20000 rupees per hectare is very high otherwise one method is there government should erect the chain link fence with its manrega labors because manrega labors is there government is funding them chain link cost uh, government will provide and uh, it will be erected so all animals will be roaming uh, outside of this link fence and our because we have seen this thing in our uh, cities resident resident welfare associations are there they have closed all the roads and made the welfare association and so that so that thieves are not coming in their areas so uh, and uh, they have uh, done this and uh, so the farmers will uh, fence their uh, village panchayat area uh, cultivated area and this is very costly also but uh, 
decision we have to take. This okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Any more question? Participant, uh, it's open for uh, discussion. You can discuss. Because uh, this is a very common problem. If we go there and ask the, what is your issues. So this is the first problem we see in uh, Rajasthan, Haryana, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh. And uh, uh, because some uh, participant has told even the elephant issue is there. Some uh, Northeast uh, Mithun and the Yak issue is there. Uh, so uh, just uh, uh, keep them allow is not possible. Well, we have very good forest area. And I suggest I found that a three four hectare land is there with the goshala. That is enough to keep all the stray animals inside. But goshalas are not having big land; they are just uh, structural bodies only, and very little land is there as per the uh, number of animals with them. So uh, animals are dying sometimes because the land is not there with them. So if uh, land is allocated along with the building and other things, then issue will not be there because we have seen uh, some village in uh, Panipat. I asked that you have this issue. They told no, we have very good goshala which has land. So issue is not there. Which have means suppose uh, for hundred animals they have three four hectares of land, then issue will not be there. And at the same time, the officials of the goshala should be uh, less corrupt. They should not think that the donated money is there. Uh, we should eat uh, uh, because uh, otherwise it's not possible. There should be some kind of audit. Uh, otherwise, uh, this is not possible. Farmers are having an at a very big uh, uh, risk. So, so this is uh, all about. I think no more question. And uh, this uh, problem I have seen, sir, uh, because uh, in the Bundelkhand area, which is a uh, uh, very famous for this. Now it is common in all the states. Earlier, this was a Bundelkhand area. It is called Anna Pratha. Anna Pratha means uh, um, animals will be left uh, for Ann. Ann means food. Because uh, we, uh, uh, animals after uh, this uh, milking, you will leave the animals. So, animal will graze this and that. Field. Who's Anna? I don't know. Their Anna means uh, their food or uh, animal's food. I don't know. Or sometimes say Anna means our South Indian words. Anna is elder brother. I <laughs> so there. Brotherhood. Many... Brotherhood. Anna means brotherhood. Uh, brotherhood. So uh, maybe brotherhood. Maybe that is also matching with the uh, that uh, tradition of uh, leaving the animals after milking. But it is a very pernicious problem in the Bundelkhand. But it's now common in all the regions. No more question. Anybody has any question? No question. Eh? So I hope uh, this was an interesting uh, session. Uh, and you all know that uh, Dr. Vikas Kumar uh, is a coordinator of uh, this training. Uh, he is uh, taking a lot of effort uh, to make all uh, help, all services to you. And uh, same time he has presented um, his paper, um, uh, this lecture here. And uh, this was uh, uh, out of, uh, you can say, track only, but uh, he has presented nicely and made uh, it uh, so inter interesting. I think you might have enjoyed the lecture. And uh, we, because uh, on behalf of participant, yes. we uh, once again thank you thank for you. Uh, giving your lecture and uh, completing it in time also. That is also more important. And uh, there is no question, uh, uh, much question uh, uh, people have asked. That means the, the things were very clear. Uh, once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Participants, you want uh, some break? Or we can uh, start our uh, next session because uh, our uh, uh, this resource person is waiting. Yes, sir. Hmm? We can continue? Yes. Sir. No reply in chat box.
you can continue we can we can yes, continue yes, huh? yeah yes no problem yes. okay okay then good we hope that uh, you are enjoying with our training uh, uh, materials lectures and all and uh, you are so happy i think that's why you don't want any break so we also don't want to give you break uh, uh, at the, this point of time so friends uh, you will be happy we have very learned uh, very experienced uh, resource person with us dr raka saxena she is uh, our colleague only working in, uh, in this institute and uh, she has got uh, some 15 year of research experience she worked earlier at uh, pantnagar uh, and uh, this ndri karnal and then uh, she is uh, since uh, uh, so many years she is working uh, in this institute having vast experience of working with uh, agriculture economics uh, animal science market and trade and uh, for uh, latest uh, burning topic is uh, doubling farmers income on that uh, uh, aspect also she is uh, working she has published more than 50 research papers in uh, national and international journals and um, uh, so uh, some uh, policy papers policy brief and she has uh, um, contributed to uh, some uh, uh, four or five books uh, book chapters manuals as well as uh, uh, uh evaluated uh, so many theses also and uh, she is a good speaker good orator also you will be enjoying the her lecture uh, now uh, you see how she uh, explain the things and uh, uh, those her to a research area is so top sometimes uh, difficult to understand uh, uh, but she will make it so interesting so nicely she will explain and uh, you will enjoy the uh, things uh, uh, very uh, easily uh, she has uh, done her msc even she uh, did mba also and a phd uh, in the uh, discipline of uh, this agriculture economics and uh, having expertise on advanced economic uh, uh, econometrics analysis and uh, research methods and uh, Uh, other uh, analytical techniques that's why we have requested her uh, to uh, deliver a lecture in this training program so that you can uh, she can share uh, her experience and uh, uh, expertise and you will uh, be benefited with that dr raka on behalf of participants and as well as uh, my personal behalf and uh, the organizing committee behalf we welcome you Uh, for this uh, training program uh, please uh, um, now uh, floor is yours uh, deliver your talk thank you thank you so much sir uh, for giving me this opportunity and uh, i am really happy to be uh, on this platform and i see many known uh, faces and known names here uh, many of my friends are also here so it i i uh, assume that this is going to be a very interactive and learning session for all of us including me uh, as well so uh, now, without taking much of your time because this is already the weekend time the fag end of the week so you must also be waiting to leave the sessions and all so i would not take much of your time uh, without taking that uh, i now share my uh, presentation with all of you uh, dilip is it visible Yes, ma'am. So we would be talking something about agricultural trade on this platform. We would be talking something about the trends. What is actually happening? What could be the methodological approaches, and how we can solve number of researchable issues? What kind of approaches do we have, and how we can take this area forward? Because this is an extremely important area these days. government of india is planning to double the agricultural exports to enhance the income of farmers and uh, somewhere we have placed uh, around 35 billion dollars as on date and now the target is to double the exports uh, to 60 billion dollars in just 3 4 years and close to 100 billion dollars in 
forthcoming years. So this area is extremely important and, and the community is realizing that we can uh, realize a lot of revenue because we have number of high value commodities which are being exported to number of nations. So, so this is extremely important area and uh, interest and, and we, do, we don't find many, many substantive studies on the theme. We, we, there are a number of studies, but actually, when we go deeper into this, uh, when we dive uh, deeper into this kind of uh, area, we find that we don't have many studies. There are a number of researchers in different institutions, they're working. So, so uh, uh, it is actually important that we identify relevant issues and we, we go uh, in proper direction to solve those uh, researchable issues. So before actually going into the approaches, I just for the for the, for those who have not uh, who have not worked in this area, I just uh, would present that what are the trends in agricultural trade, how how agricultural exports, particularly we would be talking about uh, though trade consists of both the fronts, agricultural exports and agricultural imports, and the strategy lies in promoting exports and reducing imports over a period of time. Though we cannot go, uh, you know, uh, in in telling imports every time because you know we cannot be self-sufficient in everything but you know the long-term objective is to attain self-sufficiency in agricultural production like government of india is giving a lot of emphasis in promoting oil seed sector so the edible oil uh, supply front is being strengthened with number of programs number of schemes so that the self-sufficiency is developed in a longer period of time but my lecture would actually focus on promoting agricultural exports from uh, india so if you look, there are a number of items, predominant items in our export baskets. We find that bovine meat is a significant item which is being exported from uh, Ma'am, hello, yeah? your slides are not moving. Slides are not moving. Yeah, you're still in trends in agriculture trade. Now, is, okay. Now, yeah. okay. Uh, just let me try. Is it oh, moving now? Fish no, has come? It is fish slide. Fish has come now? Yes, ma'am. No, you are not in full screen mode. No, uh, I'm showing fish slide. Is it okay? No, only meat. You're in meat right now, not in fish. Uh, Actually, uh, maybe fish. your system is slow, sir. Because in my system, there is a fish slide. No, okay. Now it's fish. Okay, okay. Then I, I'll go back. Yeah. Meat. Meat, meat, meat. Yeah, yeah. So we go back again to the slides. So meat, meat, when we look, at, see, you know, livestock, when we talk about agriculture, it, it comprises of crops, field crops, horticulture crops, livestock, fisheries, and so many other allied uh, enterprises. But uh, livestock, we know that livestock and fisheries are highly emerging sectors. The share of livestock has increased in our gross uh, value added. And both these fisheries and livestock, they are growing with at a much appreciable rate as compared to crop sector. And even if you, if you look at the recent uh, data released by Situation Assessment Survey uh, of uh, Agricultural Households, we find that there has been negative growth in crop incomes, but the uh, incomes from uh, livestock and fisheries, they have risen appreciably and particularly those some of the disadvantaged states like, you know, um, Bihar, Jharkhand. So there has been much appreciable increase in livestock uh, and fisheries incomes. So meat is an important product when we talk about livestock sector as a whole. So meat is an important product and bovine meat is one of the predominant item in this uh, export basket of the country. So bovine meat is what, the primary item in our uh, meat basket. When we talk about fish, we find that crustaceans are holding their prominent place. And uh, we have recently, uh, along with uh, Dr. Ritambara, she's also, I think, participating here. Along with Dr. Ritambara, we have done a study on this uh, uh, dynamic linkages in exports of fish from India. So we have seen that among the major major partners in the among the major global partners in the world, how how this fish export, how this Indian fish export is behaving, and how our linkage are actually moving over a period of time. So if you look, there are, there are a number of partners like Equator is there, Canada is there. So if you look at the competitiveness of all the three major, because we are the number one exporter in case of crustaceans. When we look at the competitiveness of all these uh, commodities, we can see how this competitiveness is actually moving in comparison to our other competitors, which are Canada, Equator, and other, other countries. So we have done the, uh, the study on dynamics of this uh, competitiveness of uh, exports in case of crustaceans. 
that we have done. So fish is an important area and crustaceans are the, our, our, this is our niche category. So bovine meat and crustaceans, they are our niche items. Then if you look at dairy products, we have our emphasis on dairy has increased over a period of time. And we find that uh, uh, skim milk powder and fat, butter and fats, they are the emerging items. Skim milk powder is a major item in dairy category, but uh, this uh, butter and fats, they are also increasing over a period of time. Vegetables. We are not a major player in terms of you know exports of uh, vegetable. If we talk about our global shares in case of vegetables, but it's still our exports uh, of onions. Onions is a regular commodity in terms of exports. We have been exporting close to ten percent of onion production in the country, and that's why onion export policy is the most volatile export policy in the country. So whenever we have any kind of price hike in the country, we immediately ban the export from the country, and we immediately increase the minimum export price on onions. So that's why I say that we have extremely volatile export policy in case of onions. Potato export, uh, tomato exports, uh, they are they are increasing, they're expanding, but it's still in terms of top, Government of India is giving a strong emphasis on stabilizing these three commodities on uh, potato, tomato, and onion. So uh, in terms of production, price volatility, and export policy, so we, we expect that their value chains would be more stable, more uh, strong in future, So and the volatility component uh, would be reduced. Fruits, yes, in some cases, we are the, the major players in a global uh, market, uh, like, for example, coconut is an important product which is being exported. Grape is another uh, uh, product category, bananas, they are there. And uh, so the export is uh, increasing over a period of time. Another thing is that uh, when we talk about agricultural exports, it's not that uh, our exports are only expanding over a time over a period of time. It's also important that our exports are diversified in terms of commodity diversification, in terms of geographical diversification. Because we have seen even in terms of global environment, we find that a lot of volatility is there. I mean, in somewhere we have some kind of political instability, somewhere we have some kind of financial or economic instability, and some we have we have political issues with many nations. So it's that for risk management, we diversify our export basket in terms of commodities in terms of geography so that our risk is minimized we can also you know in case of because agriculture commodities are very important from a self-sufficiency angle also and so we have to meet the domestic requirements as well so whenever we have any kind of contingency in domestic uh, environment or domestic friend we have climatic abrasions and because of those climatic abrasions whenever we have any kind of shortfall in production of those commodities we immediately rely on our neighboring countries or some other partners to to import uh, those commodities for example onions, tomatoes. We know that we rely on our, our neighboring nations for importing those commodities. So you can see very see here that very interestingly, after 2003, 2004, our export basket is diversifying and many new products are emerging over a period of time. And now, you know, those products may, sometimes may not be very important in terms of volume, in terms of value, but when we can develop the exclusive value chains of those products, we can actually get uh, fetch a lot of revenue from that. For example, I just give an example here. Uh, we have ESAP Gold. ESAP Gold, we have been, uh, uh, we have known about its medicinal value and this commodity has uh, been used in our traditional environment to cure, uh, I mean, to, to give some kind of, you know, med medical, uh, medicinal benefit uh, to the communities. But this ESAP Gold is an important uh, traditional, uh, this uh, niche item in terms of exports. So if we can develop uh, uh, this kind of value chains and we can, we can promote this, we can brand it in terms of, you know, some kind of with med medicinal utility. So those, those uh, kinds of value chains could be actually useful over a period of time. So ESA goal is one example. There are a number of uh, Kutu, Kutu Karta. Uh, I am not remembering its uh, scientific name, uh, but this, uh, this Kutu Karta is also emerging as an important item in our export basket. So we have been uh, using this product uh, for our num for number of purposes in the country. Coffee tea, of course, uh, these have been our traditional items, but many new spices are uh, emerging uh, in our export basket. Like you can see here, uh, we have pepper. 
export of pepper has increased over a period of time. We can see that we have uh, see there are spice, spice seeds and there are a number of other spices which have emerged uh, in our export baskets. Uh, we have also carried out a study on this horticulture export mapping, their competitiveness and seasonality also. So we have, we have seen how are we placed in terms of uh, export uh, advantages of certain horticultural commodities. So, so that also we have uh, attempted uh, recently. Cereals, of course, cereals, we have been a very kind of uh, stable uh, global uh, player in case of cereals. And we look, if you look at this uh, cereal category, we, we find that rice is the most important commodity. And in between, we had some kind of uh, exports of maize also increase in between. But now the rice occupies more than 90% uh, share in our export basket. So rice is the largest commodity in cereals exports. And when we talk about exports of rice, there are a number of issues when we talk about exports of rice. So those issues are actually uh, important when we talk about because we, you know, we have to meet certain macroeconomic objectives. We have to meet the objective of efficiency. We have to meet the objective of equity. We have to meet the objective of sustainability. And at the same time, we have to earn foreign exchange also. So those objectives are to be met simultaneously. And we, we have to minimize a trade-off. We have to minimize the trade-off when we talk about export of rice. We are actually earning the foreign exchange, but at the same time, we are foregoing. We are we are um, not able to fulfill our sustainability objective. So, so there are a number of issues. We we will talk about uh, that particular issue in our subsequent slides. Cotton, of course, uh, a traditional item in our export basket. Uh, so there are two items which are most important here in case of cotton. Uh, uh, raw cotton is being exported and also cotton yarn is being exported. And when we talk about uh, uh, manufacturing of cotton, we, our cotton, I mean, India is uh, competitive in exports of raw cotton and uh, cotton yarn. But when we talk about our neighboring uh, countries are uh, much more efficient. We did a study on SARC uh, trade pattern. And also uh, with Dr. Ramesh Chand, I carried out a study on India-Pakistan uh, trade competitiveness and their entire profile and their dynamics of trade. And we find that when we look at the case of cotton, Pakistan is also having similar kind of agroclimatic conditions. There also rich in exporting cotton. But when we look at uh, the bilateral trade between India and Pakistan, we find that there is a very unique kind of, you know, cotton value chain between both the uh, cotton export value chain uh, between both the countries. Uh, we export a lot of cotton yarn, we export a lot of raw cotton to them. And in turn, what they are doing, uh, they, are, uh, they are exporting us woven fab fabrics of cotton. So there is very interesting uh, value chain between both the countries. And when we look at um, from the perspective of entire South Asia, we find that this cotton value chain is an ex uh, interesting example. So this cotton value chain uh, clubbing the countries like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, which are actually rich in uh, producing this particular commodity and its variants, its various lines. Uh, so there we can have, uh, we can take advantage of each other's strengths, each other uh, locale. And then that can be uh, developed as a regional uh, uh, value chain of cotton. So there are a number of interesting examples when we can have, you know, when we talk about competitiveness or comparative advantages, those comparative advantages can be further built upon and then the, the, the advantage, the, the, those benefits can be uh, harnessed over a period of time. So these were just uh, to give you a glimpse about what is actually happening at the macro level, how trade patterns are changing and uh, how, how uh, we are getting advantage of our position in uh, global markets. Uh, now I would actually come to the methodological issues and approaches which are available. Uh, because time is limited, so we cannot go into the detail of each and every technique. But I would actually give, give you the glimpse how, what is this particular technique and in which particular situation we can actually use this and what kind of limitations are there when we use a particular uh, technique? So that kind of flavor I would be giving you. And if required, we can we can discuss in future. We can take a particular technique and then we can discuss those uh, things about uh, trade uh, approaches. We can discuss uh, in future as well. 
So when we talk about choosing a particular, because we have seen, and uh, now this, we have seen the outcome. The outcome we have seen that our exports have increased over a period of time, the exports have diversified over a period of time, and we have become the world leader in case of crustaceans, the wine meat, even we are the major, one of the major uh, players in case of rice, we are major players in groundnut, we are major players in other um, uh, commodities as well. But these are what? These are outcome indicators. These are outcomes. Now, how this actually outcome has risen, how this outcome has actually uh, been realized. So this has come as a result of uh, 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 government facilitation in terms of, um, in terms of, let's say, favorable policies, infrastructure, uh, capacity building and more rigorous processes for promoting trade. We have number of institutions which are actually promoting trade. So we have different institutions for quality uh, testing. We have for different institutions for infrastructure. We have different institutions for investments. So, so all these efforts have actually when these efforts are integrated and they have resulted in these outcomes. So. These are the outcomes. Now, in between, we have number of researchable questions. We have we have signed number of um, regional partnership agreements. We are now part of number of uh, forums, platforms where we have uh, bilateral or multilateral trade agreements. So, so this has come as a result of number of uh, uh, parameters, number of efforts, number of facilitating mechanisms. So, whatever is hidden. In that particular mechanism, we can answer those, we can solve those issues using a particular methodology. Now, choice of a particular methodology will depend upon what kind of research question we are facing. So research question we are facing, sometimes we have been given the research question from the top authorities. For example, the external affairs minister or uh, Niti Aayog is asking us, how we can reduce the import of oil seeds in the country or how we can develop the self-sufficiency uh, in case of oil seed and further as an outcome the imports can be reduced so so that is what that is a research question then under the question question can how can we promote the exports of let's say basmati rice from uh, india and how can we be more competitive as compared to pakistan which is our closer uh, closest uh, competitor in case of exports of basmati rice so that will depend upon the research question we are facing and then that research question would involve a number of uh, things like you know what kind of proposal we are having and then we have to carry out the policy dialogue with the stakeholders and then it has to be implemented so so it will depend upon what kind of approach we, we will use for example government can ask a question that you know how we have performed during covid so we have actually now um we we, we would we need to answer this particular question that you know um, how we have performed during covid and how can we further strengthen trade uh, in post-pandemic uh, phase. So we have to choose between the descriptive statistics and the modeling approaches to answer these, these questions. And every technique has its own uh, merit and you know there are limitations uh, attached with the, those uh, things. So we can use those approaches and we will go to, we will, uh, we will see those approaches one by one. So uh, there are a number of approaches, like uh, there are approaches like ex ante approach and ex post approach. And I understand that you all understand the meaning of ex ante and ex post approaches. So ex ante, I would explain here in context to exports, it involves, for example, um, we, were, we, were, we were going for uh, deliberations on this RCEP agreement. So before uh, signing or before going for any such deliberation, the question is, whether the country should be part of this kind of agreement or not. And what we gain when we, when we sign agreement or when we are part of this kind of bilateral or multilateral trade agreement. So what we are trying to do, we are trying to answer, we are adopting an excellent kind of approach and we are, we are answering the what if kind of questions. But exposed approach can also answer what if kind of questions. For example, in case of uh, South uh, Asia, we answered the questions pertaining to because we signed SAFTA uh, uh, pertaining to this uh, kind of region. So, so we, we, we saw how the SAFTA uh, has actually facilitated trade in uh, South Asia and what have been the benefits realized to the uh, member countries. So there are both these kinds of approaches being used in case of export analysis or trade analysis. 
and there are certain approaches which uh, use the partial equilibrium approach and there are certain approaches which use the general equilibrium kind of approach you will see a little more detail and there are certain econometric models like gravity model where we have number of uh, uh, variables in consideration and we estimate those parameter values those parameter values are actually the elasticities and those elasticities can actually answer the question that if we change this particular parameter how our trade is going to respond to the given variable and then use of methodology will differ uh, according to the situation and according to the uh, research question we are facing. Uh, when we start with some kind of uh, trade analysis, we actually, um, we actually uh, start with some basic uh, indices or some kind of, you know, let us say overview of trade. So, so um, I'm actually not giving her formula and all those things. Those are available. I would uh, share uh, one publication uh, with all of you, maybe with coordinator, and then they can share with you so that there we can get all the formulas, all the approaches, and that would be helpful for you. So when we talk about trade openness, so when we when we start trade theories, you mu you must be remembering that uh, we we start uh, our uh, trade theories with the assumption of the most basic kind of structure that is a closed economy. But when we actually start uh, with the development process and more liberal economies and the integration of world economy, we say that how the, our trade how open is the economy. So that indicates. And there we, we use the indices like, you know, how much is the share of uh, exports and imports to our gross value added. So when the share of trade in our gross value added or the domestic output it increases, we say that we are becoming more and more open. Our participation in the global trade is increasing uh, with the trade openness. So this is one thing, initial thing. So obviously the larger countries like uh, uh, India would be having more trade openness and as compared to smaller countries like Maldives or uh, Nepal in general, but there could always be exceptions. In certain countries, uh, their entire output is actually export oriented. Entire output is actually export oriented. So there, in that case, the trade openness uh, may be much larger for a given commodity, for a given commodity, not the aggregate trade, uh, agriculture, or overall exports. Another thing is trade composition. We talk about how our exports are comprised of uh, agriculture commodities, manufactured commodities, and other things. So uh, that may, and then even the given agriculture category, we, we can find out the composition of livestock, fisheries, horticulture. Within horticulture also, we have seen that there are spices, there are fruits, there are vegetables, there are flowers. So we can go for trade composition. These are descriptive kind of analysis and simple indices. These, these we can compute. And then what is the uh, sectoral and geographical orientation of trade? This geographical orientation of trade is actually a very interesting uh, thing, though it seems simple. But you know, this is very important, uh, like I was explaining earlier also, that this is very important from the perspective of risk management or getting fetching more uh, revenue. So when we diversify towards more niche markets, towards, towards more niche commodities, we, we might actually fetch higher revenue. So these are simple indices which we can compute and uh, give uh, some kind of introductory uh, thing to our uh, uh, research. So when we talk about trade in agriculture, so when we talk about trade in agriculture, first thing is that uh, which classification to take because uh, when, you, uh, when you find the trade data, uh, there are a number of sources of trade data and uh, uh, you don't find like, in our macro uh, documents or published sources, one uh, first and foremost source for us is in agricultural statistics at a glance. It provides us uh, the agricultural exports and agricultural imports, but rarely you would find uh, the detailed list of commodities. And then detailed list of commodity, FAO is also providing the commodity table data on exports and imports of various commodities. But uh, when we look at this uh, 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 data for commodities at harmonized system classification level, which we uh, talk about as HS uh, code based system classification. So there uh, we find the data at T1 Comtrade uh, portal, 
we find the data at IDC portal. And even Government of India website, which is called as Exim Database, Ministry of Commerce, DGCIS, they have also maintained the data at HS code based uh, system. But when you look at, you know, trade, uh, trade uh, when we talk about trade analysis, when we, when we talk, compute any indices, we actually need the global exports. It, the basic requirement I am talking about, the basic requirement. So when we, we need the global export, and if we need our, we need, if we need, if we are comparing with other global partners, we need the data pertaining to those uh, countries or, uh, for example, rice. We need data for Thailand, we need data for China, we need data for other middle producing countries. So we need data for other countries. So we must have a, have a level playing field. So we must have a level playing field. So th that level playing field, HS code classification is existing. But when we use data from those portals, we can use data only up to six digit level. For further disaggregation, we have to either go for some kind of subscription or even at HS 10, we cannot go ahead, but until we HS 6, we can get from that. Indian, Indian uh, system, it provides the data up to uh, just eight also and further disaggregated also. But there we, we don't get data for other countries. So it, it simply, the, the analysis is confined to only the Indian context. So data, data is an important consideration here. And on these global platform, if we um, either we talk about ITC or content, the, both the data are same. There we take, get data 2001 onwards. So if one is, is interested in a little longer series, if you are interested in forecasting, prediction, more of you know, modeling based exercise, then you have to go for a longer series. You can go for a longer series. So there, even contract, you can get up to only X data at a six digit level, but certain commodities we can get only, I mean, those are classified at HS8 level, they are available at disaggregate level. So data, data is an important consideration and one has to actually choose data very carefully when we work on the international trade part uh, because we must have a level playing field when we talk about global exports or global trade uh, patterns. So we can go for growth and pattern composition on all those things. Competitiveness is there, export specialization is there complementarity is there. So these are the simple indices we can uh, we can compute. One of the basic thing when we talk about trade, we talk about the comparative advantages in trade. So this is what, this is uh, the simple index, we call it as revealed comparative advantage. And revealed comparative advantage is established over a period of time. It is basically indicating the, your own inherent advantages. For example, uh, in case of fine rice or super fine rice, basmati rice, there are only few countries in the world which are exporting this because of igloo climatic conditions, because of because of those climatic advantages. So these we have realized, we have established, we have developed over a period of time. So these are RC is indicative of your your uh, igloo climate, your endowments basically, your endowments. So these could be the factor endowments, these could be your natural endowments, because of those we have developed this kind of uh, RCA over a period of time. What does this, you know, in simple terms, what is this? In simple terms, this is, a, there is a numerator, there is a denominator. Numerator says, what is the share of that particular commodity in the total exports of that particular country? For example, what is the share of, what is the uh, RCA for uh, rice in India? So. What we take in numerator, numerator is what? Uh, export share of rice in total agricultural exports of India and divided by world exports of rice divided by the world exports of India. And you will get what, for example, if let us say rice is uh, constituting around, let us say 10% uh, in total uh, exports of country. And if world share is only 6%, so, this is what our uh, com comparative advantage is stronger than the global uh, uh, counterparts. So, so we are uh, in a better situation in RCA of rice as compared to uh, other countries. So RCA, RCA can be computed in that way. So, so RCA value of more than one is considered to be, it, it indicates that we are in, a, in an advantageous situation. Now, 
this is an absolute value. So RCA for a commodity could be 20, 25, 38, to whatever. So this is what, uh, this the, this is not, you know, an in unbounded form. So we have a more closer uh, measure that is uh, the NRCA. So what we do, we, we convert it to into more symmetric uh, bounded form. So they, then we say RCA uh, minus one upon RCA plus one. So it is the ranges uh, between minus one uh, to plus one. So there are bounds in that case. So it's, it becomes more, you know, uh, uh, if the comparison becomes easy. If the comparison becomes busy, uh, easy that, you know, which commodities are, uh, in which commodities we have more uh, advantages and in which commodity we have disadvantage in exports. So this is the basic index. And most of us, those who are working in this area, we are computing this kind of index. And this is giving us um, uh, some kind of idea where we have advantage. But this is not the sole criteria where we can decide about the comparative advantage. We have to club it with number of other parameters, which can actually indicate where we are. Uh, we are in advantages position. So there are number of uh, trade barriers. There are number of non-trade barriers. There are common policies which are actually to be coupled with this kind of uh, indices to indicate uh, uh, much better about the uh, trade component. Another thing is uh, another index is on trade complementarity. So how, how there is a there is a formula there is a, some simple algebraic cal calculation when we talk about calculation of trade complementary complementarity index what does it indicate we we, we computed this when we were working on this India Pakistan uh, paper so uh, it indicates that there is there is an export pattern in exporting country and let's say our partner is Pakistan. So Pakistan also has some kind of import pattern. Or we can say we have UAE. UAE has an import pattern, India has an export pattern. And we have, a, we have given commodities. So let us say for different commodities which we are exporting, if Bangladesh is our partner or UAE is our partner. So if there is complementarity between those countries, we say that these countries are natural trading partners because their endowments are like that, one is having strength in exporting those few particular commodities and another country is importing those commodities. So there is some kind of complementarity in the import pattern and some kind of complementarity in the export pattern. So the indices which we calculate, then if indices are close to 100, that shows there is perfect complementarity. Whatever one country is exporting, the other country is importing 100%. And another thing is that zero, zero uh, complementarity indicates there is no uh, complementarity between the two nations and they're not natural trading partners. So this is, a, so we found, we found a lot of complementarity um, in our, um, in some commodities. Why? Because uh, the country, the two countries are actually, uh, having similar kind of uh, products in export basket. But we can, we, we can do this kind of analysis for uh, uh, other neighboring countries as well to indicate that where do we have uh, complementarity, higher uh, complementarity in terms of our exports and imports pattern. So this, the, we talked about some basic indices and those indices are actually many, uh, very useful in giving some idea about uh, how we are actually placed in terms of uh, other global partners, other uh, countries, and uh, uh, other, uh, what we can say, uh, regional groups, or uh, there are a number of forums, so how we are placed in terms of those uh, forums. Now comes little, little uh, modeling based part. So that is what partial equilibrium uh, trade policy analysis or simulation we can say. So many times policymakers they're interested in this kind of assessment. Uh, we gen we gen discussed this initially, but there is ex ante kind of assessment. An ex ante kind of assessment is actually very important. So this is important. Let's say when government is deciding about the tariff levels. So we, we are having certain commodities in our import basket. Edible oils are the most important category in case of agriculture and they are, uh, they are uh, constituting major share in our agricultural imports, edible vegetable oils, edible oils, they are constituting major share. 
So if government is deciding about the alternate tariff levels on edible oils, so they would be actually carrying out this kind of ex-ante assessment. So what is the likely benefit or likely gain when we reduce the tariff or when we increase the tariff? So different approaches are going to give us different kind of answers. So we, we go for some kind of simulation analysis. Let us say if we reduce the tariff by 5%, 10%, or on the other side, if we increase by 5% or 10%, what is actually going to happen? And which is the ideal situation for us? Whether we should we should go for this X% percent or Y% percent or Z%. Percent. So this analysis we are going for in terms of partial equilibrium framework. And uh, there could be another approach at the same time that we have general equilibrium approach. Because when we talk about uh, taking a particular uh, decision, it is not partial. It is not actually partial. So though we may pro provide uh, a context-based answer to it, but it is actually not uh, partial. So when we, when we give this kind of answer, let us say edible duty on edible oil or palm oil, so when we take this kind of decision, it is actually impacting other sectors as well. So we have to, we can, but you know, uh, each approach I am saying again and again, but each approach has its own merit or its own limitation. Partial equilibrium is giving us number of uh, advantages. For example, we have this approach is simple. It can provide us uh, quick solutions. And there are a number of ready-made models uh, which can be used for answering uh, the co research questions based on uh, partial equilibrium kind of analysis. And those uh, models can be uh, used uh, by the practitioners who are working in this, that particular area. And we don't have huge data requirements. We don't, so partial equilibrium analysis is actually uh, useful many times. Uh, and uh, smart model uh, is actually uh, being used uh, uh, in this context. Uh, so smart model, we have heard about this, that when we want to, when we want to uh, compute the impact of uh, any kind of tariff change, what will be the impact of any tariff change uh, uh, when we two countries are trading with each other? So what kind of benefits uh, this uh, tariff change is going to create uh, in terms of trade creation, in terms of trade diversion? So what we can see here, there are two graphs which we are seeing here. Kindly refer back to our, your own, this, uh, we, we used to read about this indifference curve, price, price lines, budget lines, and all those things. Uh, we can see here that um, there are two graphs, but they show trade creation and trade diversion. So A graph is giving us what? I'm giving a situation that here, country A is being given low tariff as compared to country B. So country B, the tariff rate from country A is lower. And country B, in case of country B, there is no change in tariff. So what is happening when the tariff, uh, when country A is being granted lower tariff? So what will happen, how the price line will change? The price line, so in terms of lower tariff, actually the quantity from country A would increase. Quantity from country, we can buy more goods from country A. So the quantity would actually increase from A0 to A1. And because the prices are favorable uh, for country A, the diversion would be there from, because the commodity is same. So there would be diversion from country B towards country A. And country B, in case of country B, the quantity would decline from B0, B0 to B1. And in case of country A, because there is lower tariff, and then because of that lower tariff, the price realized would be lower. So larger quantity can be bought from country A. So the, there would be a positive diversion in case of country A from A0 to A1, whereas there would be negative diversion from country B, that is from B0 to B1. And why it is called, it, called as diversion effect? Because there is a diversion. Nothing extra is being created. So there, the trade from country B is being diverted. The volume from country B is actually uh, being diverted from B to A. Because of what? Because of simply policy change that is a lower tariff towards country A. And if this continues for a longer period of time, what would happen? This, if this continues, so what would happen? 
country A, besides the trade diversion, more quantity can be bought from country A. So there would be initially, let us say, if we were buying only 50,000 tons from a country and this low tariff uh, condition continues, so we can actually buy more if we have more price advantage in terms of lower tariff. So there would be creation from A1 to A2. So besides trade diversion, we have trade creation effect also. And this is what, this is because of simple one policy change that is lower tariff granted to country A as compared to country B. And we have a smart model which can actually help solving this kind of uh, problem uh, for us and then the model can calculate these two diversion effect and then creation effect and such kind of problems uh, can be solved by using this kind of analysis. So let us say if this was uh, palm oil, uh, we are importing a lot of palm oil and we have, let us say, we have two partners, Indonesia and Malaysia. So if we are granting lower tariff to one country and we are uh, not changing the tariff with respect to other countries. So let us say we have a preferential uh, tariff towards one and the other one is um, MFN kind of uh, tariff. So that, that would lead to this kind of situation. So in this case, we can also go for applying general equilibrium kind of analysis. General equilibrium kind of analysis is what uh, general equilibrium, uh, we have this kind of analysis. This kind of analysis, and we have, uh, we have read uh, this kind of social accounting matrix in our course curriculum also, uh, that uh, we have different sectors, we have activities, we have commodities, we have factors, we have households, we have government, we have rest of the world, and then we have total of each and everything. Now you may ask a question that how, how changing tariff for a particular commodity would actually benefit, uh, how actually it will have some kind of disequilibrium in case of uh, different sectors. Now, I would try to help you here that when we change the tariff for, uh, let us say, palm oil or any commodity, let's say wheat or any other pulse we are having, what would happen if this continues for a, let us say if this is for only shorter period of time, this will not create much of, much of the disequilibrium in the other sectors. But if this is happening for a longer period of time, this will actually have a lot of impact. So if we are having a low tariff for a given commodity, what would happen? There would be a lot of consumption. I mean, consumption change would happen in favor of that particular commodity. So how we can capture that particular consumption change? So the households would be, there would be change in terms of households expenditure. And if this happens for a number of commodities, there might be significant change noticed at the household level. Now this might change exchequer's uh, revenue front also. So uh, government as a chicken uh, would be would be impacted in this case. Then we have we have factors. We have labor market here. We have labor market. So when we talk about lowering of tariff, lowering of tar tariff would actually impact the production. Would actually impact the production. Would impact the farming sector. And so the demand for factor uh, in demands in factor market will change. And this would actually change the production consumption uh, balances, production consumption equilibrium in long run. So in long run, if we are trying to change the situation, we might go for general equilibrium kind of framework. But handling the social accounting matrix is not a easy, rather it is a daunting task. And only few institutions in India, they are actually working on this kind of analysis. We have, uh, we have IGDR, IGIDR, Indira Gandhi Institute of Development Research. We have some persons, some uh, experts in uh, National Council of Applied Economic Research. We have few other, a uh, few others, Institute of Economic Growth. And then uh, one of our scientists is also working on the social accounting metrics. We actually did this for, uh, in our income uh, framework also, that how if we change exports, how these are going to change the income. So we, we here, you know, it, how we know that social accounting matrix, when we handle a social accounting matrix, its balancing is extremely important. So both the fronts, the, the metrics must be balanced. The metrics must be balanced. And if we if we have any any small error in the metrics, 
our two sides will not be balanced. So we have, we can see here that we have expenditure side, we have receipt side. So if our expenditures are not matching our receipts, we will be having some kind of disequilibrium or disturbance in the matrix. And then if it is not balanced, we won't be getting the solution. And it requires huge data. For every sector, you need huge data. And then we uh, other problem is that we will not be getting the real time data we have lag data when we talk about factor in factor market labor data from where we get the labor data labor data census is conducted in every 10 years we have now data for only 2011 now when we talk about the other data source this is now periodic labor force survey so that provides us quite recent data but that has come recently on consumption front we don't won't get data only we are getting data, recent data, household level data, we have up to only 2011-12. So that, you know, those coefficients, we don't have real time data. So balancing the social accounting matrix is not an easy task, but still in long run, we should be able to find solution. We should be able to find much precise solution from, from the help, with the help of the social accounting matrix. So uh, this was about, so we had a research question. The research question was that whether government can go for lowering of tariff or a hiking up of tariff or any other thing. So then we can have partial equilibrium kind of approach. We can have general equilibrium kind of approach. So this was one question we faced. Another question we are facing that why our trade performance is different with Netherlands? Why our trade performance is different with, uh, let us say, uh, Canada or Equator or any other country? So how we can analyze this bilateral trade flows and what are the drivers for those bilateral trade flows? So let us say if we talk about India and Pakistan or India and UAE or India and Bangladesh. So how, how uh, that bilateral trade flows would be governed over a period of time? And uh, there has been a principle of gravity on this. Principle of gravity, it says that uh, the, 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 you know, similars, they come together. They come together. They are attracted towards each other. So what is the similar thing here? The similar thing is that the economies in terms of their size. The theory says that the countries having similar GDPs, similar outputs, they uh, they tend to come in proximity and then they tend to trade with each other. Now, there would be rarest example, except for a niche commodity that a country like Nepal is exporting huge to USA. So, so that's what it says. And then we have proximity, it's in terms of distance also. So the neighboring countries, they tend to come together. And when they tend to come together, it's because of, you know, uh, optimization of trade cost. If we trade with uh, Canada and if we trade with uh, Bangladesh, of course, the trade costs are going to be significantly different. And then, you know, uh, in this uh, gravity equation, we have, let us say, the, the export volume or the trade volume between the two nations, it is a function of what? It is a function of their respective gross domestic products. So now we say that this is gross value added. Now we have adopted this kind of economic national output measure, gross value added. So they, they, it will be dependent on their outputs. It will be dependent on what kind of incentives the countries are providing to each other. For example, if we talk about our case with uh, Bangladesh, so let us say all of us, we are part of uh, SARC. So we have a SAFTA government gov agreement, which is governing all uh, South Asian countries. And there is another country like Canada, there we have, we might be having some other agreement. So what kind of incentives we are providing to Canada? What kind of incentives we are providing to Bangladesh? So that incentive part would also be taken care of. Another thing is that in terms of, you know, we can have dummies also here. Like we can have, there are countries which are totally distant, maybe in terms of, you know, islands kind of situation, or they are landlocked, their borders are closed, or we sometimes we share borders like Bangladesh, in case of Bangladesh, in case of Pakistan, we share borders. So we can have dummies for those, we can have dummies for incentives, we can have uh, dummies for some other non-tariff barriers. So, so uh, we, we answer this kind of question with gravity model. I have not shown here the equation, but equation is like our regression function, where trade volume is a function of the respective uh, national outputs. 
the incentives in terms of tariff, uh, preferential tariffs, in terms of their geographic distances, in terms of some other dummy variables. For example, another dummy could be, for example, we are part of certain agreement. So we can have a dummy that, you know, in, with Bangladesh, we are part of this. So we have a, we have a agreement uh, together and then we are part of that agreement. So we can have dummy for that. So we, with the help of this regression framework, we can get estimates what we get. If we, if we convert all values to log, what we get, we get the elasticities. We get the elasticities. So elasticity would tell us whether our trade performance is driven from incentives, whether our trade performance is driven from some kind of agreement, or whether our trade performance is simply because of you know, our uh, national performance in terms of the performance in terms of our GDPs and the sectoral shares and all. So that would give us elasticity kind of thing. But here, though it is people have been using this kind of gravity model with different variants, it also has number of uh, limitations. The number of limitations is that, you know, uh, in case of trade data, uh, in case of trade data, we actually uh, cannot interpolate the data in many situations. Like, you know, in other cases, in other cases, for example, if we are doing the price analysis, if we don't have price for Delhi, what we can do, we can, we can assume that the similar price in nearby market will prevail in Delhi also. So what we can do, we can assume something we, are, we can interpolate. But in case of trade, sometimes it's very difficult to interpolate because there might not be trade in that particular year. There might be zero trade because of certain situation. So if we interpolate that trade, taking some kind of using some kind of econometric techniques, that might be wrong. That might be actually wrong. So that, you know, this is a something, you know, very tricky kind of thing. So, so data is, data and trade actually plays with important role. So data, data issues are there. So once we have data issues, we have to choose a particular modeling framework and then uh, we have to go ahead uh, for solving a given problem. But uh, this kind of issue is actually, uh, I mean, uh, gravity model actually, yeah, this, this has evolved over a period of time. Trade is what? Trade is the outcome for a number of things. Like, you know, this COVID came. COVID, when this COVID came, so trade relations with China, actually, they were hampered. Uh, people stopped trade from China. USA stopped trade from China. And then, you know, initially, we also had some kind of uh, restrictions. So, so that is the outcome for many things. It's not only, you know, GDP or some other quantitative variables. It's sometimes part of many qualitative factors. Like, you know, when we talk about trade between India and Pakistan. So trade is part of many other political uh, foundations or some so many other things. So sometimes it's very difficult to capture those qualitative dimensions. We cannot fit a dummy for that. So because it's actually too much of qualitative uh, variables, so it's very difficult. So, but, you know, this smart model model is very helpful in giving us um, answers to some kind of research question that how we should we actually go ahead with tariff and other things. Um, then another thing is that uh, many times the government is seeking answer that uh, which commodities exports uh, we should facilitate more. So people have been studying this kind of trade gains uh, analysis. So trade gains is a macro level answer, which, which we have to provide to stakeholders or policy makers. So that we have to see, you know, how, how our exports are actually contributing towards uh, the national output in terms of gross value added, or how they are inducing change in gross value added. So we have two kinds of hypothesis here. Uh, people have been studying this thing for past three to four decades. There are two kinds of hypothesis. One is export growth linkage. The other is growth export linkage. Export growth linkage is growth led export or export led growth. Now, so this depends on the stage of economy. When we talk about growth led export, so initially when the economies, they don't have sufficient surplus. So what will happen initially when the sector would grow? For example, our export volumes have risen, uh, you know, very, very significantly over a period of time. We had the ex largest exports during 2013. And after that, you know, beyond that also our export volumes uh, have been higher. So 
when we don't have sufficient volumes, what we are going to export? So it's actually initial initial stages. It is going to be growth led exports. When we have higher growth in livestock, when we have higher growth in fisheries, our exports are also going to increase. And when we reach a particular level beyond that, it may be something like export led growth export led growth in a particular uh, commodity but you know so we 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 have realized this thing uh, in our recent study and we have seen how different commodities are actually building or uh, you know proving or disproving this kind of hypothesis that we have export led growth or uh, growth led exports uh, in certain commodities so this is an important area and uh, there are a number of Evidences available on this that you know how exports cause GDP or GDP causes exports. Different researchers they have actually studied this and so how the causality is being built. So here comes you know when we talk about this particular export growth linkage. So what we have done we have actually uh, we are talking about broad four components in trade analysis. There are four four broad kind of approaches here. One is indices based approach. The initial part we have discussed, trade openness, real competitive advantage, complementarity, uh, or any other geographical diversification, geographical orientation, concentration, all those things are what? This is what simple descriptive analysis based on indices. And these indices are actually very important and they indicate how, how we are performing for a given commodity, for a given country. So this is a very important area. Another thing we discussed about uh, this partial equilibrium approach, where we need to answer that whether the country should go for some kind of policy change and what are the likely gains from that particular change, policy change. It is actually very important. So there we had two kinds of approaches, uh, partial uh, equilibrium and general equilibrium. So when we, when we look for, let us say, developing oil seed economy of India, slowly it may, for example, it may be, for example, reducing the uh, duty or increasing the duty on palm oil. So this may be initially a short term solution short term solution for reducing uh, just now i was going through the news that the palm oil imports have recently reduced uh, by around 29 or 30 percent so it may be it, it may be something initial short term solution but over a long period of time this should be studied in you know uh, general equilibrium framework but general equilibrium framework as we discussed it has its own um, problems and limitations another thing is that uh, we have macro macroeconomic uh, questions and how trade actually induces the growth or growth induces the trade so we have role of time series analysis so here we have a different approach which is time series analysis so this these linkages uh, we are using with the help of time series analysis so we have time series analysis we have uh, like uh, this basic uh, co-integration causality impulse response kind of analysis and then another is uh, we have bar model so we have different assumptions if those assumptions are fulfilled we are going for normal uh, co-integration causality analysis if we have different uh, assumptions in the data set we are going for a uh, var model so but these basically answer these kind of uh, questions so how trade would induce imports or how uh, uh, sorry how trade would induce the growth or how growth is going to to induce the trade that will depend that will that uh, answer can be sought from that kind of uh, approach so these are the uh, evidences in terms of elg or gle kind of uh, hypothesis so such as they have used number of uh, models uh, another thing uh, is that uh, trade has a lot of volatility you might have seen in data also that uh, volatility is extremely high in trade. And then, you know, many times researchers or stakeholders, they have been highlighting this part that our export policy is also responsible for this volatility, like I told you about onion. Onion trade is also very volatile. Every alternate year, we are having some kind of price spikes. One year, we are going to six rupees per kg. Another year, we are going to 80 rupees per kg or 100 rupees per kg. Immediately, we have change in export policy. And because of that change in export policy, our export relations are hampered. That we have certain promises with our importers sitting abroad. And then when we, when we, when we are not able to fulfill those promises, our trade relations, they are hampered. 
So that's why, you know, if there is a lot of volatility in exports. We have seen in exports of uh, maize. We have seen it in exports of uh, other products like horticultural products. So this volatility can be, should also be studied. And then we need to demarcate what are the factors which are responsible. And uh, there are a number of factors which are responsible for this uh, volatility. Another is, one is the, the change in production environment. We have climatic abrasions because of those climatic abrasions, our export policy is also uh, tuned accordingly. So those uh, production front parameters are important, our trade relations are important. So there are a number of policy shocks when we talk about, there are a number of shocks. So one is in terms of policy shocks, uh, another is in terms of climatic shocks. So we have models which can actually capture this kind of thing. So that those shocks can be captured in time series analysis also. Like we have, uh, we have volatile, for studying the volatility, we have Garch model. We have different variants of Garch model. Generalized autoregressive uh, conditionally hypothesis model, a uh, Garch model. So we have like, you know, exponential Garch, we have uh, T Garch. So we, we can have, we can build that particular shock in time series model. For example, we have climatic shock. So we can have a dummy for that climatic shock, we can have, we can either have the absolute data in terms of, you know, deviation in rainfall from normal rainfall, but we don't have that real time data for a given market or given locality or production cluster. So what we can have, we can have some kind of dummy here and that dummy can uh, uh, incorporate the shock. Another is that, you know, we have changes in, uh, in terms of, you know, global uh, environment, global relations, how, how our relations are there with China, how our relations are there with Pakistan. So we can have a, a dummy for that also. So that uh, this time series analysis can capture uh, capture that component also, but we have to see how how precisely uh, we can capture this kind of thing. Another thing is that uh, that we can go for like I told you about volatility in trade. And another thing, like you know, we were discussing about uh, partial equilibrium kind of analysis. So we have how we government of India provides subsidy sometimes to promote uh, to facilitate exports. So how that uh, export subsidy has facilitated the exports of a given commodity. We have quantitative restrictions, and then we have bans, immediate bans. We have minimum export prices. So how these things are actually putting a barrier or hampering trade or they facilitating trade. So we can answer that question with the help of partial equilibrium kind of framework, and we have a smart model for that. Uh, we can study our problems uh, there. And then how studies are also focusing on, we have different regional trading blocks. Like we have ASEAN, we are part of ASEAN. We, we, there is ASEAN, we have other uh, regional blocks also. So how, how trading patterns are being changed once we are part of a particular trading block? So how, how that those impacts are being created, how trade is being facilitated once we are being uh, part to that particular trading block. I was mentioning about that, uh, this was about trade performance analysis of trade and then benefits from trade, actually the export, uh, the, the stakeholders, they are interested in getting the answers to all those things. But when we look at in terms of the macroeconomic framework, we have another macroeconomic objective that is sustainability. Uh, that is sustainability. So when we when we look for higher efficiency, higher uh, for an exchange, we include we look for more inclusive approach. We look for including more of small holders into our export value chains and all. We have to meet the sustainability objective at the same point of time. And when we look at the sustainability angle, we, we find that exports of rice from India have increased many folds, many folds. So we exported in initial years around 11 million tons of rice was exported um, close to 50-50 basmati and non-basmati close to 50-50. Um, so the exports have risen continuously. And we know that rice is a water guzzling crop in India and exporting rice, one kg rice, it actually 
people have reported now different coefficients for this and then it actually there are virtual water exports which are involved with that so so there has been a lot of concern on this increasing virtual water uh, trade with respect to commodities like rice uh, rice is the most important crop sugar cane is there we have cotton also so we have those crops where we have a lot of virtual water exports which are involved so we cannot forego with the exports of those commodities but now what we have to do we have to go for regional crop planning in the sense that we we have different areas which can be tapped more for this so so much sustainability angles are actually very important and then we have to we have to go for studying the sustainability dimension in trade also globally number of studies have been conducted on this in india people are also studying this uh, dimension so this is important dimension when, when we talk about uh, uh, trade exports enhancing exports sustainability is important issue here another thing is that uh, we have to study like you know we were discussing about general equilibrium framework um, so what we have to do, do over a long period of time like professor ramesh and he has been discussing about uh, uh, this uh, impact of trade policy on consumption of edible oils so so uh, i mean sir always emphasizes that how we should study that you know how when we have, when we change the uh, trade policy in case of edible oil sector how it has actually impacted our oil uh, consumption so consumption changes over a period of time because ultimately when we have change in trade policy either tariff or some kind of liberal policy we can have the price realized changes so when we have lower price for a given commodity when we are importing it it actually induces the consumption so how whether our consumption patterns are tilted or skewed in terms of more healthy diets more healthy patterns or we are actually you know tilted towards a more unhealthy kind of consumption pattern so there is there are distributional impacts of those trade policy one is on consumption part the other is on farmers let us say farmers how how reducing the tariff for a particular commodity is actually actually impacting the farmers how it is actually actually impacting impacting the farming uh, sector in india so for those what we need to do because this this we cannot answer at the macro level we don't have any data on this so for this we need to have some disaggregated data so we take some kind of you know um, we need to have unit level data from farmers we need we need to have unit level data from consumers and then we should have some kind of level playing field in other countries also because what will happen if we show if we exhibit this kind of distributional gains to households whether farming household or consuming household different countries they will project globally in different way unless we have a some kind of level playing field we have a standardized methodology that we have this kind of just a minute so we need to study this kind of distributional impacts now no, i mean we don't have any any systematic efforts on this but i think uh, in in coming years this is also important that you know we 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 design some kind of framework we design some kind of framework either at ministry of agriculture or ministry of commerce or let us say ministry of consumer affairs that how we are actually creating some kind of distributional impacts on households when we have change in some kind of policy decision because ultimately if palm oil duty duty is changed it is actually impacting the consumption pattern so how is how it is trickling down at the disaggregate level that has to be captured so this uh, we don't have any data uh, for this so we 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 may have some kind of household survey or we can have some kind of like we have situation assessment survey we have consumption surveys we can have some kind of integration in those uh, surveys we can get some data from those this is very important so again we were discussing about uh, data issues in trade uh, data issues are actually very very important uh, so handling missing values is uh, an important concern in uh, trade data data abrasions are there different nomenclatures ex are existing so a beginner in this kind of analysis is confused which nomenclature is to be used 
So we have to be very careful and uh, we should have a strong capacity building in this area. Trade is very important area and we don't have many systematic studies in case of agricultural sector. So we should have some kind of strong capacity building in this area. We should go for adopting systematic methodological framework and answer the questions systematically so that our policy makers are benefited from this. Another thing is that um, uh, we have Dr. Ritambaraya, she, she has done uh, some analysis on export potential uh, of cotton uh, and uh, she has also published one paper on that. This is a very important area. So, so in case of India, we don't have this data for different commodities. This I have taken from uh, ITC export potential map. It indicates how much potential we have realized and how much potential is still left. For example, if we can take the case of rice, we have only realized only 53% of our total potential. You see that, you know, even after import, exporting 50, 11 million tons of rice, we can still realize that we can still export close to 9 million tons or so. Still, we can export uh, that. Uh, so, a lot of potential is there in different commodities, shrimps and prawns. We have a lot of, we are the number one in case of crustaceans, and we have close to 50% potential left unexplored in case of cotton, in case of horticulture, in case of tea, lot of potential is untapped. So that potential needs to be tapped, uh, like bovine cuts and uh, this meat part uh, for only 50% is tapped. So close to 50% potential is untapped. And how they have actually done this? So, uh, so as, as a group of social scientists, as a group of, you know, agricultural economists or agribusiness, what we can do, we can have systematic studies on assessment of export potential assessment. You may have number of commodities in your area. For example, somewhere we have lychees, somewhere we have cluster beans, somewhere we have uh, other commodities. So what we can do, we can have systematic studies. Uh, what, how they have done, how they have done this. So what uh, export potential assessment, they have taken export potential indicator. It has been assessed on the basis of it export performance of that particular commodity. It is computed on the basis of demand and it is computed on the basis of ease of doing business. And this is very important in trade. How many export channels are there? Though we have been improving in terms of ease of doing uh, business in our country, but it's still, you know, we need to, uh, in case of agriculture, we need to have more systematic approach. And then we have to do this ease of doing business, like certification, testing, we have export inspection council, how much, how many steps are involved in clearing that particular commodity, testing procedures, all those things. So how that ease of doing business is operating. Uh, so we need to go for uh, export potential assessment. This is actually very important at the regional level because we have all those agroecoregions, agroclimatic zones, and we have different commodities. For example, this uh, transgenetic plain, we have basmati rice. So all those things we need to um, do at the disaggregate level. And you are aware about this uh, agricultural export policy. Government of India is promoting exports. They are diversifying export basket with number of mechanisms. Like we have in this uh, budget, uh, Government of India has uh, relied a lot of, uh, they have uh, relied on uh, investments, they have relied on infrastructure. So what we would be now having dedicated cargoes, uh, which would be linked with the terminal markets. And uh, then uh, that's how our exports would be increasing over a period of time. Uh, we need to go on some, you know, that's uh, what I'm saying that regional commodities, niche commodities are very important. And we need to identify those commodities as a researcher. As a researcher, uh, we need to identify those commodities. So these are the elements and we, there are the takeaways uh, that, you know, capacity building is very important in this area. So we need to create a pool of knowledge in this area. We need to systematically work. Uh, those who are working in state agricultural uh, universities and central agricultural universities, they can give uh, students uh, this uh, the topic on uh, trade. So uh, we need to really uh, promote research in this area. And then we a uh, very interesting thing which I did not cover actually here uh, in this session because time was limited. We we also also did the impact of COVID on trade initially uh, in the initial year of COVID 2020. And uh, you would be very surprised to uh, notice that uh, uh, we had complete lockdown in April 2020, 
and it uh, from March to April, and then some partial kind of lockdown further also. But exports of vegetables, Indian exports grew significantly for some sectors, they grew significantly in that span of six months. Initially, there was drop in exports, but export of vegetables, they increased significantly in that particular period. So I had em emphasized in an earlier forum that, you know, we really need to give uh, this problem to our students that how, how those supply chains, how the ease of doing business was introduced uh, in that particular period that our exports, when the commodities were um, not that freely available in the domestic market, because you know, fruits and vegetables, they were initially, uh, when agriculture was not uh, eased from those regulations, we, we did not uh, find much of fruits and vegetables, but you know, exports, they increased. So how those supply chains were strengthened, how that ease was introduced through those export chains. And then this is a matter of uh, exploration. This is a matter of research. And then we need to have strong market intelligence in the case of international trade as well. We have uh, emphasis on domestic market intelligence, but uh, we need to have strong emphasis on market intelligence and international trade uh, as well. So I think uh, this was all just a glimpse on what we have done recently, just a, uh, we have done uh, RCAs on certain commodities. We find that our rice is one of the important commodities and we have been performing very well in case of rice, meat of bovine, crustaceans, cotton. Uh, cotton, uh, we have been, uh, the performance has been uh, variable over the years, but rice, exports, etc. Very interesting thing here. This shows how our product diversification is changing. Uh, this orange orange point uh, bullet is giving uh, the data for diversification in 2020. And it is very interesting to note that for certain commodities, we are still at we are still at the same level. For example, you, you can see in case of crustaceans, which is, I mean, where India is the leading player in global market. We are at the, we have come back at the level of uh, 2001 in crustacean. What does it indicate? It indicates that, you know, we need, uh, I mean, because this is a highly perishable commodity and this requires, uh, you know, some kind of sophisticated infrastructure for exports. So we need to give this kind of facilitation so that we can capture uh, the newer markets, the emerging markets for this commodity. Because see, 2020 years may we have again come back to the same level. And uh, woven fabrics, again, we are at the same level. And there was one more cupboard. See, spices, in case of spices also, we are not diversifying much. Uh, Bovine meat, our diversification has increased. So we have to see how we can increase the diversification. Major destination. Uh, this growth analysis we did that how uh, export-led hypothesis or uh, growth-led export is true. In case of onion, do both the uh, hypotheses are, are true. Uh, this is two-way hypothesis. Exports are causing growth. Growth is also causing exports. But in general, we have export-led growth. In case of rice, we have export-led growth. When rice exports increase, actually they 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 uh, cause our GVA to increase. Tea also has single uh, unidirectional causality running from exports towards growth. So these are some of the efforts which we have recently done. Uh, we have done studies on. Uh, fisheries, horticulture, and other sectors also, but paucity of time that did not allow me to take advantage of those studies and share with all of you. So this is all from my side. Any point, any discussion, you, you're always welcome. Um, point is that we need to work together. We need to work together and we need to have a lot of you know capacity building. We need to learn from each other and then we need to work on the niche commodities. So this is very important area where we need to work together. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for a nice presentation. Uh, I request the participant if there is uh, any query regarding uh, the any issue, please uh, inform us. So, in chat box, there is no any question, but in uh, in question, there is one question, ma'am. Uh, please say something about export of dairy product. 
chat box yeah 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 so export of dairy products uh, anju bhagat uh, yeah export of dairy products uh, we when i was at ndri we did something on exports of uh, dairy products uh, see you know milk is highly perishable commodity so what we need to do we need to actually uh, convert it to more of value added products so uh, exports of skim milk powder and uh, this uh, fats and oils it has increased over a period of time but we have much larger players in the global market so uh, indian dairy products is still you know we could not significantly increase our dairy products uh like you know we are we have global presence in case of crustaceans bovine meat etc but still our exports are increasing and we need to give emphasis on the quality sps issues and the qualitative issue and uh, dimensions in exports of uh, dairy products uh, and we have we have number of emerging items in case of uh, dairy like we have probiotic milk we have other categories as well so we can uh, identify the niche commodities and we can uh, work on that uh, um, the number of students uh, at ndri they they took this topic uh, dr bitan mandal uh, did this, uh, very good study on trade of dairy products um, so uh, we can we can we can we need to study the sps issues and then uh, that way we need to promote the exports of dairy products thank you ma'am Uh, any other issue is there please uh, inform uh, it was a very uh, nice lecture uh, explain uh, very uh, clearly about all the theoretical aspect the practical aspect and uh, the trade relations trade uh, partners directions on all the topics i think uh, participants have explained this some very nice lecture so yeah on this excellent very end in front of you you know we need to work together yeah we need to you know make our presence felt here so we need to work on collaborative studies because there are number of commodities which are regionally important in nature and i think we can we can have some kind of smaller groups uh, which can work uh, on those commodities or sectors like we have fisheries like uh, anju said about dairy so we have designated institutes we have designated products we have designated uh, regions so we need to work in collaborative approach because you know regional insights are very important we need to work on export oriented commodity chains so those commodity chains would be promoted on the regional basis in terms of you know cluster approach production cluster approach and uh, that kind of facilitation needs to be provided so that is extremely important that is extremely important we can use students for uh, exploring number of uh, issues and studying number of issues that could be helpful for us thank you ma'am any other query is there please inform it was a very nice lecture uh, there is no more query from uh, any participants thank you ma'am for uh, such a good lecture uh, to our participant for coming uh, for this uh, lecture uh, thank you ma'am any thank you Thank you so much. Thank you all the participants, and uh, please be in touch so that we can work on this uh, thing together. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. So, uh, uh, sir, any other thing we require to discuss with participant, Dr. Subhas sir? No, if participants want uh, something, uh, they want to uh, inform us or they want to discuss. Uh, it's open now. Otherwise, yeah, we will call off the day. Any other issue is there uh, from the participant side? Please inform us. Uh, so, otherwise, uh, the session will be uh, closed uh, now. And uh, tomorrow is the holy day, and the next day we will be starting at uh, same uh, our normal schedule, which is available with you. So, tomorrow is holy day. That's for information. So, I think uh, there is no issue also. So, shall we, sir, uh, close the session now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, all participants, for your uh, support. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, all organizers. Thank you. We shall meet now.